Hey, um, so we're back. I, I wanted to kind of put this all together um, and, and think about modern global climate models or GCMs. So how does this actually all work now? So we, we took some time and kind of built some steps and saw, you know, how for really a long time we've kind of known but there was the possibility that we could put together these um, parameters, right? these physics and chemistry and kind of energy balance equations and build a computer program that can simulate Earth, right? That's the goal. And I always like to think about, you know, I don't know how many of you all have had calculus out there, right? But if you could think about, like, there is the actual Earth and the actual observations and what we try to do is make models that get closer to that, right? There's this limit, right? You're never actually going to be able to make a model that's kind of perfectly in line with Earth systems and captures everything. But we try to always kind of push closer and closer and closer to reality. Um, so I did just want to kind of talk about the nuts and bolts of it. I'm not sure if I have the drawing capacity to do this. I'm going to... So the foundation of a climate model is, again, we've talked about these different parameters, we'll, we'll get back into them, but they are calculated for a small area, right? The notion of cells or this kind of Cartesian cell system. So if we thought about, um, you know, here's planet Earth, we could slice it into a whole bunch of little, essentially squares, we're pretty darn close to squares. And then each of those squares, so now we can think about, so for each of those cells, kind of down here at, at the surface of the earth, let's say this is our you know bottom cell, it's going to be interacting energy-wise in each of these directions, right? Energy is going to be flowing in and out of that cell. Um, but because a lot of Earth's climate lives in, in the atmosphere. These cells are also stacked. So you can imagine the Earth just kind of covered with these little theoretical stacks of cells, and each one is interacting with its neighbor in these directions. And then also there's interactions kind of in this vertical sense. Um, so it's pretty complicated, and, and, and as you can hopefully see, this is kind of where the data starts to get really overwhelming. So um, a kind of standard, you know, not, not incredibly precise, but a good kind of standard global um, climate model might have half a million cells. So every time you run one kind of mathematical iteration, you know, what's the situation, what's the energy balance that's going on here, that has to be done for each cell, um, so half a million times. And then in each of those cases, each cell is going to change the energy input of its neighbor, and then these are run in time increments, right? So we talked about 10 or 15 minute um, kind of time as, as a 10 or 15 minutes as a time step, right? So you run the model, you know, each of those intervals. So it's big, right? Um, in running these, you know, far into the future, take a long time to process that data. And again, this is really in the realm of um, kind of supercomputing. So again, I want to just go back to this notion of cells now that we know you know, how big this model is and how often it's be run, being run. Um, for each individual cell, um, you know, again, here we'll just have this one be like the surface of the Earth, the bottom doesn't really matter. Um, but the most basic climate models have kind of that minimum four different variables that they're keeping track of in each. Of again, I'm not here to um, make you do any math, at least this week. So just a couple of things. So each of these these four these four kind of fundamental parameters, wind velocity, pressure, temperature, humidity, just as a kind of tip of our hat to the types of equa equations that we're going to use, these are all generally partially differential equations, groups of equations, um, you know, fluid dynamics equations, um, gas law equations, I guess probably, among other things with pressure, um, also conservation of mass. 
um, and momentum equations. Temperature, so that has to do with thermal energy equations and fluid dynamics equations again, because we're also moving energy as a function of fluid dynamics. Um, and humidity, which has to do with moisture, and again, conservation of mass um, equations. So like the real world conditions that these are all standing in for are things that we should be familiar with, right? So convection, and this is, you know, heat being moved around as, as air is moved around. Um, advection, which is energy that flows through a medium if the medium isn't moving, right? Like heat traveling through a metal rod, right? That's um, abduction. Um, land processes, so land use change, that's something that we've talked about a lot. Um, that can kind of modify these things, right? So these are, are ways that we have to kind of set up those initial conditions. Um, albedo, so the reflectivity, right? How much of this energy is headed back? Um, you know, hydrology is a pretty big one. Um, so precipitation, which is kind of fairly difficult. And that's also coupled with cloud cover. We've talked about this, you know, in, in weeks past where cloud cover is really one of the most challenging, right? There's a lot of components that can modify and change cloud cover, and it can also affect other components of the model as well. So again, my, the point I've been making over the last 10 minutes is that they're complicated, right? So we can stand back and we can look at our big global circulation model. We can see, you know, how gridded it is. We can see it on the stack, you know, how many layers there are to our grid. Um, and again, we start to see some pretty eye popping numbers. Um, obviously, as computing power increases and computing time is reduced, we can hopefully make the grid smaller, right? So again, that tries to get, you try to get to finer and finer and finer and finer and finer res, finer resolution. Um, and another thing that happens is oftentimes people will use kind of regional models, right? So we can have these big, you know, GCM climate models. Um, but if you're interested in some, you know, a particular area, if you're interested in, you know, how the kind of sagebrushy desert mountainous west works, you know, like in Nevada or something, right? You can run a climate model that's kind of based on those boundary conditions. And so, you know, not every in not every case we're running this huge, massive climate model. So this is going to be, kind of, it's, it's kind of a hypothetical picture, um, but it's going to allow you to think about how any of these individual cells might exist, right? And, and the variables that may be there in one cell and not the other cell. Um, so this kind of puts all of them together. So first of all, your cell might be over land or might be over water, right? So that's kind of a good first order observation or some cells obviously are partial, right? Some cells overlap, part of them is water, part of them is land, um, might be salt water, that might be fresh water. So in that water, there's advection. Remember, that's heat traveling through the water, not the water traveling itself. So that's part of it. We've also talked about thermal haline circulation, right? So there's also energy being moved as the fluid is moving. Um, we've also talked about, you know, the shallow, um, the shallow ocean versus the deep ocean. So all of that can modify you know, how the energy balance of the ocean works, right? What are the kind of thermal halon current conditions? How's the energy just transferring through the body of water itself? Um, then we've got kind of deep water and shallow water mixing. So that's a lot to keep track of for an ocean cell. Here we might have ice on part of the land, right? So that's you know, important to kind of think about, you know, we've talked about albedo um, and how that, how that affects. Um, there may be grasslands, there may be a forest, there may be, you know, lots of different um, kind of other configurations of the land energy. Or again, what we've talked about is land use as those change, or you have to kind of change those parameters in your model. Uh, so snow, clouds, right? Or you might have some other big kind of thunderstorm sorts of clouds where you've got, you know, precipitation raining down, but energy is going to interact with these different types of clouds differently. Um, there's also going to be wa general water flow from the continents into the oceans. 
So that's heat conduction, right? So you've got heat in that water as it's moving around, flowing around in rivers, temporarily living in lakes. Um, I had this advection here that also happens in the air, right? Some warm air can, warm air can warm neighboring air, right? So the energy can transfer without the air actually moving. But then we also have the air actually moving, right? So those are all kind of intertwined. Um, and then on top of this, kind of to think about going in and out of our, our square that I've drawn here, we've got solar radiation coming into the system and generally shortwave radiation. And we've got longer wave radiation coming out of the system. So here, energy in, energy out, all of the rest of the diagram is how the energy is moving around within this one particular cell. And then again, we could kind of further grid this. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts of, of how a modern climate model works. And an important thing to keep in and an important thing to keep in mind is that this is young, right? So we really started running these computer models in the 1950s, the first really kind of successful, fairly long-term um, modeling of the climate started in the early 1970s. Um, and most of the climate models ran in the 70s predicted warming. Um, and so there's kind of a couple of famous ones. Sawyer 1973 is a famous climate model, kind of one of the first that really kind of had this like prognostic aspect. And it predicted, you know, it didn't predict temperatures for every year, but for the year 2000, using their model, they predicted warming of an estimated 0.6 degrees between 1969, so they backcast, and 2000. And it turns out the observed was 0.56. So, you know, they did a pretty darn good job. Um, but again, you can take that error and figure out where that error came from, right, between your model and your observation, and hopefully change your model to reduce that error, right? That's how you tweak your model to make it better and better and better as time goes on. Um, so Broker, 1975, this was published in Science Magazine. Um, he built a simple energy balance model. And again, you know, thinking about what your cell phone looked like in 1975, the size of a car, right? Um, so the technology then wasn't great, but he was predicting CO2 concentrations and he predicted 375 ppm for the year 2000, um, was pretty darn close. He was about five parts per million off, but his model kind of went exponential with CO2. And so beyond the year 2000, his warming estimates are really high um, because he was kind of doubling the CO2. Um, and the last kind of big energy balance model we can talk about was uh, Hansen, 1981. This was a guy who was working for NASA at the time. Um, and he built this energy balance model, 1981. And he, he made three different scenarios, right? So three different scenarios with CO2, like no CO2, continuing on increased CO2. And the fastest change that was predicted with this energy balance model falls about 20% short of what we actually see in warming. So it didn't predict enough warming, even though that was this fastest model. Um, but the world really changes. So 1981, moving into the late 80s, our climate models become much more significant or much more precise. We start to incorporate all of these other aspects. So you can see we kind of add things into the model over time, right? So first we just started with these really basic energy balance models. Then kind of Milankovitch said, okay, well, it's not just straightforward. Here's some other variables that change. And now we're kind of having land use change and CO2 and all this really dynamic stuff captured in these models. Um, so Hansen comes back. And the last one that we'll talk about is kind of a um, older uh, climate model, Hansen 89. And this is much more sophisticated. Now he's incorporating some of these things. And he again builds three scenarios, like an A, B, and a C, um, with increased CO2, no CO2, and kind of business as usual. And so model B that he that he put together, so Hansen 89, falls about 10% higher than current observations. 
And again, like, yes, the prognostic aspect wasn't dead on. Um, it was within kind of error bars. Of course, it was in the margin of error. Um, but also what that allows us to do is say, okay, well, why, why did that happen? And when you can pick his, his model apart, so he was about 10% high, the coefficient that he had used that linked CO2 to warming, he basically overestimated slightly, right? And so that's an example of how we can say, okay, where did this 10% come from? How can we make that 0%? What value do we have to change? And they had used this empirical value that linked the, um, the amount of temperature change to CO2 concentration, which needed to be refined. And so again, that's an example of how we can use observation and model to actually just make better models, right? And that's kind of really, you know, the goal going forward, right? To, to find where your model fell apart and how we can um, make it better, right? Um, another really interesting thing that, um, you know, some people have brought up is that if we just model all of this um, material as I've outlined here, this is Earth's natural system, it predicts temperatures far cooler than we have. Um, and the reason is this doesn't incorporate anthropogenic CO2, right? And so when you include that as a, as a component to your model, you can actually see that they, they start to jive really well. But actually, observ observed temperature climbs higher than predicted temperature um, with most models when they leave out anthropogenic CO2. Um, but we'll talk to uh, well, we'll talk to someone to see if we can get a little bit more um, kind of clarity with that. All right, so here is a potential cell or how things are going to work out. Um, know that we've got these kind of partial differential equations that are keeping track of how energy is moving from cell to cell to cell. And a simple model has four components, right? Wind speed, humidity, temperature, and pressure for each cell. And you need to figure out in which direction that energy is moving and how it's moving to each cell. There's about a half a million cells and we're churning that data on about a 10 minute turnaround, right? 10 minute time step value. Um, big time. So supercomputers, right? Again, um, you know, the, there's supercomputers all over the place. Not every person working on a climate model has one. Oftentimes the data is literally delivered to a center right? saying, here's how we want to test this model. I mean, you've borrowed someone else's computer to do that, right? It's not something you're generally able to do like on your kitchen table, right? All right, catch you next time.